All right, great. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I hope you, you know, sort of immediately answer. I hope that we have a sort of popcorn style when we're getting to those question parts of the section. And I think I'm going to talk uh, about hopefully five things uh, that I think are important to discuss. And I hope we'll leave you with some new knowledge and some new thoughts about how to prepare for debates. The first thing I want to talk about is a concept called uniqueness. Um, and this is a fancy debate word you should never ever use because you all do words, world schools, but this is the shorthand that I'll be using to describe this concept. It's a weird word. There are other words for it. Like if in debate you've ever heard someone describe a harm that the other team is talking about as parallel, i.e. it's happening in both worlds, it'll happen the same amount in both worlds. That's what they're referring to. They're referring to the uniqueness of the argument. It's debate shorthand because it sort of describes like whether an argument uniquely applies to one side or actually is applies to both sides, whether it's a, it's a unique argument for one side. It generally describes the conditions of the world of the other side. So an argument um, has a bunch of parts and this part of the argument, the uniqueness part of the argument, describes the world of the other side. And I'm gonna use like a weird metaphor to sort of get you an idea of what I mean. But before I do that, we're gonna prep a motion for like five minutes. So. This house believes that religious organizations should adopt progressive interpretations of their doctrine. Uh, I want people to like take two minutes and think of just like op arguments on this. Talk out loud. I don't know, message your friends. I'm going to cold call on somebody. You said a proper op. Op. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, does anyone want to ask me what this motion means? Everyone, everyone's clear on what it's about? All right, let's see. Um, Brendan, would you like to give me an example of a potential op argument? It doesn't have to be more than a sentence. I can't hear sorry. you. Yeah, sorry, probably something to do with religious freedom. Like as a matter of principle, we should never force religious institutions to change their doctrine unless they want to. Okay, I agree with that. Uh, I think a potential problem with that op argument is that um, we're just describing what religious organizations should do. It's not a mandate. It's like a question oh. that, right? Like whether they should or shouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think the, this house the, believes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but let's see. Uh, Max, could I have an op argument? Uh, sure. This, I don't know how applicable this would be, uh, but I feel like adopting a narrative of encouraging uh, progressive interpretations of doctrines when there's very few bright lines regarding what constitutes being progressive. I feel like this could be very reminiscent to sort of the westernization or whitewashing of like uh, multicultural religions that sort of occur throughout history. You could impact that out in several ways. Okay, I think that's interesting. Let's get some other ideas on there. Uh, Caroline. I think like an argument somewhat to do with like how our understanding of progressive is constantly changing. So not necessarily the link about westernization, but about how society is constantly progressing. And so constantly changing the religious doctrine would be like um, subjective to time. Something like that. Okay. Um, I, I just want to be clear. Is everyone clear on what this motion is about? Like an example of what this, like, like this motion is about, like the, this, it's basically saying this house believes that the Catholic church, like the Pope should say that being gay is okay. Um, it's about having like religious organizations 
uh, take religious doctrine that's like pretty much like very conservative. So like, um, I don't know, like Islamic interpretations of like where women should be in society. Um, and then like have the organizations that are like the main founders of those religions. So like that'd be the Pope for the Catholic church, like various imams for Islam, uh, say that the, their religion is actually supports the progressive interpretation of the doctrine. So a big example of this would be like the Pope being like being gay is fine and, and completely consistent with Catholic doctrine. Could someone give me a potential op argument for why this would be a bad idea? Like why a religious organization shouldn't do this? Um, I think this may not be applicable, but I think one thing is that this would encourage like different sects to break off that are like so in such opposition to the progressive doctrine. So rather than just like falling in line with the rest of the Catholic church, this would encourage like, like, no, I totally think this is the right op. I, I, I actually, like, I think this is the op, actually, um, which is just like the, yeah, no, you're very, like, you're, you're completely correct. It's also the answer I was looking for. Um, so I think the opposition argument, that's just like, the conservatives leave is like, very, very good. Um, and I want to talk about the various parts of this argument, right? So this argument would say something like, conservative members of the church are pretty okay with the church in the status quo, right? They're huge fans of the church. They really help out. If the church were to espouse progressive doctrine that they believe is contradictory to their views, those members would leave. And the church would lose a lot of supporters. The church would lose a lot of people that give money to the church. The church would lose a lot of people that, you know, spend their time on soup, at, at soup kitchens. A lot of people that like, you know, volunteer or like, you know, do a lot of um, proselytization. Now the metaphor I'm going to give is a car, uh, speeding off of a cliff and i think this car um describes any op argument you make um any anything that says that there's a harm to doing the proposition and the various parts of this sort of metaphor of a car flying off a cliff matter if i told you you were in a car that was heading off a cliff what kind of questions and, and, and like you know like it was sort of, sort of barreling towards the edge of this cliff and I was like, you can ask me any questions about the situation you want. What kind of questions would you ask me, uh, Genevieve? What would you want to know about this situation if you were in it? Um, how fast the car is going? Yeah, yeah. So like, um, what's pushing the car towards the, what's pushing the car towards the cliff? How fast is it heading there? What's another question? How do you stop the car from going off the cliff? Yeah, like, is there anything else that could maybe make the car go another direction? Um, what about, what, what else? Why is the driver going off a cliff? Yeah, that's uh, X, right? Like, what's pushing the car in how off the cliff? The I agree. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, how, what is the, uh, what is the uh, steepness of the cliff? Anything else? Could you survive the fall? Yeah, I think that also falls under, like, uh, how deep is the cliff? Um, there's, I think, one more. How do you get out of the car? Yeah, that's like a more practical question, um, but I guess we're just talking about like the, the distances uh, right now. How soon will you go off the cliff? Yes. What is, how close are you to the cliff right now? Um, I think this structure describes the structure of an argument very, uh, a structure of the uniqueness of an argument very importantly. So let's take this argument about how the conservatives leave. Um, I think that the, I would map that argument onto the car analogy like so. Um, conservatives are not leaving right now. So this distance is pretty big, right? Um, but uh, progressive doctrine will cause conservatives to leave, i.e. it'll push the car off of the cliff. And that's really bad because conservatives do a lot for the church, right? So relevant questions are how far like how much does it take to get these conservative zealots to leave the church whether progressive doctrines are enough to do that whether it's enough to drive the car off the cliff and how bad would it be if the car fell off the cliff now when you map an argument to this car analogy in this manner it's really really useful because you find multiple ways to attack the argument so now not only can you say look like a progressive doctrine isn't going to make conservatives that angry, right? It's not going to, they're not, they love the church enough so that they're not, it's not going to have that big of an impact on them. Um, so when you're doing that, you're diminishing the size of X, right? You're saying, okay, the driving force is not that strong. 
Alternatively, you don't have to contest the size of X at all. You don't have to say progressives won't upset, progressive doctrine doesn't upset conservatives. Rather, you can just say that the size of A is so big that it won't matter, right? So you can say, well, conservatives love the church so, so much that even if the church were to violate their beliefs in this instance, it would be not enough to push the car off the cliff, right? So instead of A being like a very short distance, a is an extremely long distance. Like if the car is 100 miles away from the cliff, then it doesn't matter if you push the car 10 miles closer to the cliff, it's not gonna fall off the cliff, right? Or you can diminish the size of the fall of the cliff. Like how bad would it be if the old conservatives left the church? Like they're dead in 10 years anyway, right? Like it's better to get new people into the church. Um, so you can diminish the size of the cliff. So does everyone sort of see how uh, the car analogy maps onto like different aspects of an argument more than just like your thing angers conservatives it also gives you insight into well how likely are those conservatives to leave how close are they to going off the cliff how bad would it be if those conservatives left i.e how steep is the cliff um how much is progressive doctrine likely to upset the conservatives in 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 that manner i.e how big is the size of x which is the driving force um pushing them to the cliff right um yeah, so that's the car analogy. And uniqueness uh, deals with A. Uh, uniqueness is all about A. It's how far is the car from the cliff right now, right? Um, so <clears throat> if you were to say, like, uh, another way you could potentially attack this argument is by saying, well, that's like uh, already a done deal, right? Like churches are like more scientific now. Like they're not like super like doctrine-y anyway. Um, and they're generally sort of softly progressive anyway. So that means that instead of A being 100 miles long, it's like negative five miles long. The car has already fallen off the cliff. So it doesn't matter because in their world, the car's already gone off the cliff. So it doesn't matter if we make the car speed up a little anyway, the car's already gonna fall off the cliff, right? So when you address the uniqueness of an argument, you're talking about uh, questions that concern A, i.e. the distance between the car and the cliff. And when you're on the other side of an argument, i.e. when you're prop, you can contest uniqueness in both directions, right? You can say that either the car is really, really far away from the cliff and it's never gonna fall off no matter what you do, or you can say the car is already off the cliff, so it doesn't matter if you push it a little more anyway. So that's how you can use this car analogy um, to describe op arguments. The way you use the car analogy to describe prop arguments is very similar. Um, uh, can anyone actually guess how you would use the, uh, so let's come up with a prop argument first. What's a good prop argument on this motion? Um, anyone? It helps universalize more faiths because people might yeah. feel included. Yeah, I, I think, and, and, it, and it sort of like gets like a specific new group of people into the church. Who, who, who might that possibly be? The youth? Yeah, yeah, you get young people, right? Um, and remember how I said that the car analogy is sort of reversed uh, when you're talking about it for a prop argument? Anyone want to take a shot at mapping this, like, we bring the youth into the church as a prop argument onto the car? Well, like, based on the diagram, it would, it would be why. It would be like, how do we, like, bring the car back, back away from the cliff? Yeah. So... I agree with you. Um, and think about it like this. When you're op and you're defending against taking an action, you wanna say the status quo is fine. When you're prop and you're defending taking an action, you wanna say the status quo is bad. And if X is a description of what the world of the other side looks like, i.e. the status quo, um, or like a, a description of what your world, like the world you're affecting, then what would X be in this instance? It's like all the old like fundamentalists are dying out. So like the religion is dying out and they need like- Yeah, young people. precisely. Uh, young people are leaving in droves. Like young people are leaving right now and that's really bad. Um, so what would Z be? Religion collapses. Like there's... Yeah, it would be that, it would just be like, like religion loses followers, right? Like it loses all the young people. So what would Y be? Like young people okay. showing the religion? Yeah, it would be the, the mechanism of how progressive doctrine um, gets young people, right? 
Now, if you're up and you're attacking this argument, you can attack the argument again from multiple directions. You can say, you can even contest Z and you can say, well, young people don't matter that much to the church anyway. Like they're not gonna like go out and like proselytize and they're not gonna dedicate their lives to the church. The impact of young people isn't as big. Um, you can contest Y, you can say, no, progressive doctrines aren't likely to get that many people into the church, like they just don't care. And I think the best response to this argument is actually contesting X. If you say that young people are not like, if you say that young people are leaving and the car is already off the cliff, it doesn't matter how much progressive doctrine you add, they're not gonna come back. And you can characterize why are young people leaving right now? I, you're characterizing why is X already like less than zero, right? You're, you're explaining that like, look, young people don't like the church because of like, you know, they like science or young people don't like the church because they don't like organized religion, right? Uh, young people are generally like more free thinkers. Young people are generally more liberal. Um, even if the church adopts a progressive doctrine, like young people aren't gonna forget the extremely discriminatory history of the church, right? So in this argument, instead of just attacking like the impact and the mechanism that says progressive doctrine gets young people, you're actually attacking the uniqueness, right? You're saying that like, look, even if progressive doctrine were to move the car like five feet in this direction, there are a whole bunch of other forces like um, science that are moving the car like 10 miles in this direction. So the car is gonna go off the cliff no matter what. Even if the proposition moves the car a little bit to one direction, it doesn't matter because there are forces that are stronger that are gonna move the car off the cliff anyway. Right, so this analogy helps you think about multiple ways to attack an argument. And this is important because when people usually attack an argument, they're, they attack an argument just in terms of the mechanism, right? They just attack, they would, they would attack this argument just by saying, no, I don't think you'll get all the young people, right? But that's not the strongest response to the argument. The strongest response to the argument is that there are a bunch of other forces driving the car off the cliff. So it's unlikely that even if your mechanism is, uh, like makes young people happy, that doesn't translate into saving young people from leaving the church, right? It doesn't actually do enough to affect the car in a meaningful manner. Okay, right. so that's the car analogy. In other formats, this concept is called uniqueness. Uh, some of you who have done other formats is, are probably already familiar with it, but I think that it's important for people in a world schools format to like be aware that this exists. And this is what other, like, uh, other formats call it because it's like, like, yeah, other formats have come up with a jargon for it, but it's a, it's a good argumentative concept, right? There's, there's nothing to be lost by thinking about arguments in multiple uh, dimensions. And even if you'll never use the word uniqueness in your life, which you never, ever, ever should, um, it's important that in your head, you're thinking about the uniqueness of your, other, of your opponent's arguments, right? And you're thinking about the uniqueness in both directions. You're thinking, is the car already too far away from the cliff that it doesn't matter that we push the car towards the cliff a little bit? Or is the car already off of the cliff so it doesn't matter whether you try to save it or not, right? So it's very, very important to be thinking about the, the conditions of the status quo and the conditions of the uniqueness of your argument. Does anyone have any questions about that? All right, great. Um, before we move on to the next concept, we're gonna take like a two minute break. Um, you can turn your camera off, go get water or whatever. Um, I'm gonna start in like two to three minutes. Um, and if you're just gonna be here, uh, someone tell me about the most interesting impromptu motion they've debated in like recent memory and like what made the round cool and fun. And someone I haven't called on to answer a question yet. No one's had a fun round in months. So snow. Impromptu isn't fun. Impromptu is so much fun. Ah, uh, not anymore. I, if if I controlled world schools, I would delete prepared motions. <laughs> not at all. Impromptu sucks. Maybe I just look at impromptu. It's just, it's all messed. No, no, okay, to be fair, impromptu sucked for the first like three, for the first like year and a half for me. It, it took me a solid year and a half. Like, like it was after uh, WSDC that I started liking impromptu motions. 
Um, so it might take a while, but I think impromptu motions are definitely way, way better. Maybe, maybe. What's one of uh, your motions that you liked? Uh, like a motion that I debated recently that I really enjoyed? Yeah. Okay, um, me and a friend of mine, uh, we were uh, doing drills with the, the like uh, the WSDC Final Five. Um, and uh, we, we were uh, govving, uh, we were prop on this house support slum tourism. Um, and it's a really, really fun prop because like the liberal intuition is like slum tourism is bad. Like, you know, like you're going in there and you're just like touring slums and you're just like looking at poor people. Um, but I think the gov is actually like broken. It's so strong. What? The gov on slum tourism is just like, it's an industry. It gives them cash. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that gov is just broken. I, I have no, like, it was a really fun debate because, um, it sort of reverses like, uh, I guess like American liberals intuition about topics. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's my problem with like impromptu though. Cause like, I mean, I feel like for like the first five minutes, I think that one side is stronger than the other. And then by the end of the hour, I'm convinced that the like other side is way stronger. Yeah. I mean, that's useful. I, it's always great to think about the other side. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Um, another, another motion where I think what like, the liberal intuition is like probably wrong is like uh like this house believes that charities ought not use uh graphic images in their advertising um, i think the intuition that piece most people have is like yeah they probably shouldn't use graphic images um but i think the op that's just like you get so many more donations because people would just need to be shocked into donating is really good too I had a round uh, a couple months ago about like how immigrants uh, change the uh, should change their uh, native language, like their native name to a more westernized name. Um, oh yeah, assimilation uh, motions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. Yeah. and I think in that case, the liberal intuition was also kind of wrong, especially in the round that we had. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I actually think that's a really strong. I think there's a really strong gov there. What is it? Like, it's just like, it's just society is much easier to navigate. Yeah basically yeah. yeah and you're unlikely to change anyone's mind yeah um, like like you yourself are like very unlikely to change people's minds it kind of sucks yeah i mean i think there's a version of the op that's like very very good um but like i think that yeah Oh, uh, one that I always found fun was uh, talking about whether we should break up Amazon or break up big tech. Dude, I think the, the, the leftists are being like, they're nuts on this one. Like, you should obviously not break up big tech. Yeah. Such a bad idea. It's, that's a fun motion. I think that's like yeah. one of the best motions. Like, I think we had that this, week, this year, yeah. Yeah, it's a good debate. All right, uh, I'm going to restart. Uh, I, I think everyone's hopefully back. Um, yeah, I'm gonna see if the cameras are on. I mean, it doesn't matter, you don't have to, but yeah, I think enough people are sort of here. Okay, I'm gonna get started. The second thing I wanna chat about is a concept called fiat. Um, and uh, typically fiat is taught in this really weird way, which is like, if a motion is like uh, this house uh, believes that the US should adopt single payer um, healthcare. Uh, fiat is usually taught as like the gov gets the right to like say that this will happen uh, and we should discuss like whether it should happen and objections that say that like this is very politically unlikely don't matter, right? Um, and, and it's typically taught as like a theoretical norm, which is like in debate rules, the gov has the power to say that um, the thing that they're advocating for happens. And then you have to debate about that. Um, and and the, the question of whether it will happen is not relevant um, because otherwise the negative, uh, because the opposition will always just win on like, well, it's not gonna happen, right? That's absurd. It's not a debate rule. It literally stems from words in the motion. It, the word should, means that the debate is about whether single payer should or should not happen, 
not about whether it will happen. Fiat is not this like theoretical rule. It's just a description of the is ought fallacy. <laughs> like if I was like, you shouldn't murder and someone was like, well, that's not gonna stop me. Um, does anyone think that's a relevant objection to the phrase, you shouldn't murder? Right, like if we were debating about whether you should murder or not and someone was like, well, that's not gonna stop anybody. Um, that doesn't matter, right? Because the words of the, in, the, in the motion, you shouldn't murder, are clearly about the, the normative desirability of one side or the other, right? So I just wanted to break that from the get-go, which is that fiat is not this like rule or this power the government gets. People describe it as like the government gets fiat power to be able to implement their side of the motion. Yeah, it's not like a power. It's not this magic wand that like is this some like theoretical rule of the game. If you're debating this topic, then the government obviously gets to defend a world in which the United States does it or like should like, you know, should do it. And the opposition defends a world in which the United States shouldn't do it, right? So I think that like, you should understand fiat as coming from the words in the topics, particularly the word like should or the word ought to, right? Because it, it, it def describes an obligation to do something. So that's my like thing on fiat uh, in terms of like, it's a, it, it just, it stems from the words in the motion. The next thing I wanted to discuss is opposition fiat or counter models. Um, can anyone give me a quick stab at like what a counter model is? Isn't it more or less just a counter plan? So like the opposition advocacy for what we should do in place of the model? Yep, it's what the opposition says we should do instead. Um, and typically some people are like, you know, oppositions don't get to have a counter model or stuff, something like that. It's very silly. Um, and that's because, again, none of these things involve a theoretical discussion of the rules. They all just stem from relevant questions about the motion. The reason the opposition gets a counter model is because of a concept known as opportunity cost which is if I do something and in doing that, I foreclose another thing that could have been beneficial, um, then the, oh boy, did my, my, my Zoom just cut out on my iPad. It's okay, I think I'm back. Um, then uh, in doing so, I, like, liter I, I foreclose another good opportunity, then benefits to that opportunity are a, are a, you know, a reason or a harm to voting for the proposition, right? So, and then the other reason counter models are good is because they demonstrate that the proposition is not necessary to resolve the harms that they're talking about. So if the proposition says, you know, like a lot of people don't have health care, right? Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm re-logging into the Zoom on my iPad. Um, yeah, uh, if the proposition says like a lot of people don't have health care, the opposition definitely gets to say, well, like, that doesn't mean single payer is necessary, right? Like, that means that, like, the government should provide health care to those who need it, but it doesn't mean that it has to mandate everybody provide health care, right? And that's important because in order to prove that the government should provide single payer health care, the government has the burden of proving that everyone needs to be mandated to purchase health care from the government, right? So the government side or the, the proposition side has to prove why single payer health care is necessary, not just why health care should be improved. So that's why counter models are good is because it tests like actually it tests whether the government policy is actually necessary for the thing that uh, people are sort of discussing ought to happen, right? So motion is single pair. Now, what is opposition fiat or an opposition counter model limited by? I believe that the opposition can't defend and or advocate for something that takes more political capital than the proposition because otherwise it's not an opportunity cost, right? So if the proposition says that we have enough political capital to establish single pair and single pair ought to happen, I think the opposition very reasonably gets to suggest that like, hey, we should have like some version of government healthcare, but not complete single pair, right? And all of those questions become relevant to testing whether single pair is good or bad, right? It becomes relevant to testing whether there's some opportunity cost to having single pair healthcare. Um, but that doesn't mean that like, so that's why it, it would, um, that's why like you get the same amount of political capital on the opposition to use for your counter model. But if the motion was like, we should give Africa a seat on the UN Security Council, I think it'd be illegitimate to suggest that like, no, we shouldn't have a UN in the first place, right? On the opposition. Like while that technically is mutually exclusive with the proposition case, it's not something that ha it represents the, an opportunity cost to doing the proposition, right? 
there's no reason giving Africa a seat on the permanent uh, on the permanent security council forecloses like some future where we magically have enough political capital to literally abolish the UN, right? Like the debate isn't happening in the same world um, or in the same like terms of a trade off of political capital. So in, in simple terms, uh, fiat just means you're discussing whether something should happen and opposition fiat isn't some like special theoretical magic rule. It's just you testing whether something should happen, right? Like you're just testing whether the proposition arguments are actually reasons to vote for the proposition side. You're just testing whether there's an opportunity cost to doing the proposition. So I, I think that like shifting your understandings of these concepts from like a weird theoretical model where people are like, well, these are the rules of fiat. The government gets fiat power, um, which are phrases you'll hear people say, uh, that's very silly. In my opinion, it just means you're debating a should statement. Um, and all of these questions become relevant to a should statement, right? Like if the should statement was like, I should get Taco Bell for dinner tonight. And someone was like, no, you should cook a healthy meal instead. No one would be like, ah, but the opposition doesn't have fiat power to demonstrate you should cook a healthy meal. Like those obviously irrelevant question because if I, if I get Taco Bell, I preclude the possibility of me getting a healthy meal. So uh, whether I should get a healthy meal instead becomes a relevant question to the opposition side of that debate. Um, okay. So that's the second concept. Anyone have any questions about fiat? Uh, generally speaking, are counter models uh, popular in world schools or? Um, yeah, but usually oppositions are, there's like a higher burden on opposition to demonstrate the feasibility of the counter model. Um, I, I think the rule of thumb is that if you use less political, if you do less of a drastic, you can't, a counter model should not do something more drastic than the proposition. Um, a counter model should generally do something less drastic. And that's the same sort of nor the rule of thumb I gave about using the same or less amount of political capital. So if the debate was about abolishing like the financial sector, um, the opposition can obviously advocate for reforms. But if the proposition was about like, you know, reforming the financial sector by like reinstating Glass-Steagall, right? The opposition can't be like, we're gonna abolish the financial sector altogether. Um, and I think that's how you should think about it. Okay, okay. About uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. You can okay. go for the next. Oh, okay. A uh, question about like the using more political capital than the app insofar as it can prove an opportunity cost to the app. I like get how that would apply uh, if you're trying to establish a counter model that's mutually exclusive with the app because like obviously if they take more capital it wouldn't be an opportunity cost. But insofar as you're running a counter model not for the purpose of posing an opportunity cost to the app but instead implementing some sort of policy action that can resolve the harms of the prop case. Well, like a, net, so a net, net beneficial counter model? Uh, yeah, like an yeah. advantage counter plan. Uh, would the same rules of political capital usage apply? Because in that yeah. construction of that counter plan, it's not phrased as an opportunity cost to the plan. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. The, the, the problem is that um, I think in world schools debate, they have like a very reasonable thing that's just like, the motion sets the amount of political capital you have. Um, so like it, the reason why you would adopt like a public option in this country might be like, it's very, very difficult to get single payer adopted, right? So when the motion is like, this house supports a public option in the United States, or like this house believes that Democrats should support moderate candidates over progressive candidates, it's taking into the account the fact that doing the like bigger action is substantially more difficult, right? So then the proposition gets to say that like, even if that's ideal, um, it's not likely, which is why we should go with the like less drastic action. So whatever amount of political capital or like energy or difficulty the, gov the proposition policy requires is basically the amount of energy and difficulty you have to work with in terms of finding another solution that could resolve the harms. So even if you're trying to demonstrate that another solution can resolve the harms, <coughs> um, if like the proposition I think has a reasonable intuitive objection that's just like, yeah, that might be the ideal solution, but given its unlikeliness, we should probably focus on this interim solution instead, which is in fact often relevant for the political choices of deciding to pursue something like public option, option or like a moderate regulation of the financial sector. Okay, um, any other questions? Yeah, so um, the proposition does not always have to like fiat the op counter model. Like feasibility is always like a good argument to use against an op counter model. Um, yes, but if you say that their model is not feasible for similar reasons that apply to your model, then you're kind of in a rough place. 
Like if your model is like, we're going to have single payer healthcare and they're like, no, we should just have like public healthcare. You're like, that'll never pass in the United States. Uh, then you, you, you know, you see what you've done there. Um, so it, it, feasibility becomes a relevant question when they're, um, when they're using substantially more political capital than you. Um, and then, then it becomes a relevant question to like, well, the reason we should do our policies because theirs is much, much harder. Um, but this is again, why the opposition get basically gets as much access to like the amount of political capital you're working with. Yeah. Okay. Um, third thing I wanted to chat about if there are no more questions is weighing um, and a bunch of thoughts I have about weighing. Um, so uh, weighing is very, very important. In my opinion, it might be the most important part of debates. Uh, does anyone want to take a stab as to why someone who has not asked a question or answered a question yet, please? Well, weighing is probably important because it, because it's kind of like the ships passing the night versus actually addressing each other. I mean, it proves why regardless of their arguments, why you can still outweigh and have kind of larger benefits. Yeah, I agree that it's important because like, uh, it's important to engage your opponent's arguments, but there's like, some, there's like a, like take that a little bit further. Uh, somebody else though. It proves why your impacts are more important than that of the other side. Yeah. Um, and why is it important to prove that your arguments are more important than the other side? So the judge can decide which side's argument they buy the most, the most. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think there's something much more fundamental in all of these, which is that like, hopefully all debaters are like generally intelligent people, right? And they'll make an argument that makes some sense. So a lot of people walk into debate and they're like, I'm going to completely wreck everything the other side said. They won't have a single argument left when I'm through with my eight minute speech. That's like never real, right? Like, uh, people set motions because there are arguments on both sides of them. Uh, people debate because there are things to be said on either side of them. So there will never be an instance where the other side is going to not win an argument. And that's the reason you weigh. The other side will, in almost every single instance, win a substantial objection to your side. How do you advance and win the debate from there? Debates, in my opinion, are in fact less about whether the objection exists in the first place, or whether you've adequately refuted the objection, but rather weighing between multiple reasons to do or do not an act, uh, do or don't do an action. Because actions have competing reasons to do them. That's why they're set as motions. That's why they're debatable in the first place. So the real thing that makes weighing super important is that like, there's never going to be a world in which there isn't an opposition argument or a, or a proposition argument, right? There's never going to be a world in which there isn't a reasonable reason to vote for the other side. So what do you do from there? you have to outweigh it. You have to say that your reason is more important. And I think that like 70% of debate is about saying why the reason you think, like why the reason you say is more important uh, against the motion is more important than the reason they bring for the motion, right? And I think that's like the vast majority of debate because of this like general concept that like, you know, things have multiple sides to them and people are smart and they'll make arguments like, like, you know, shocker, like your opponents are gonna say smart things, like, you know, be prepared for that. Um, so. How, uh, that's the, my principle behind weighing, which is everyone is gonna be right sometime. So the most important guiding principle, which I'll call the like zeroth principle of weighing, is that you have to be reasonable when you're doing it. Um, you have to like accurately assess the risk of your side. So a lot of times in debate, when you're debating, you like lie, right? Like you're like, uh, like you'll make an argument you don't necessarily believe in. You'll say that their argument isn't very strong, even though it is. Um, and you'll like try to explain why their like generally true argument is actually false. And that's good because that's what debate is about. Um, but when you're weighing, I think you should be very, very reasonable about the risk of their argument, right? Like you have to be, you have to be telling the truth about how much of the argument they're winning in the debate. And that's important because only then will your weighing ever be uh, like useful, right? If you're weighing and you're presuming that their argument has no risk whatsoever, then your weighing is not useful. Um, your weighing is only useful if it takes into account the fact that they're winning some portion of their argument, right? If your weighing is only useful if you're being honest about how much of their argument you're winning. All right. The first way to weigh, see what I did there? Yeah. Um, uh, it's a very simple formula. It's probability multiplied by magnitude. Um, it's uh, just like um, my impact is more probable than theirs, um, and my impact is bigger than theirs, and therefore it is a bigger impact. I think pretty much every reason one our impact could be bigger than another impact um, is tied back into probability or magnitude. 
So some people may say like my impact outweighs on time frame. It happens faster, right? Um, that matters because it makes the impact more probable. Some people might say my impact matters because it's more long term, right? It lasts longer and it affects more people. That sounds like a me reason the magnitude of their impact is bigger. So all reasons why one impact might be bigger than the other side's impact come down to the simple formula of probability times magnitude. And it should be what you, what should, what you should be using to weigh uh, any impact against each other. You don't wanna say probability times magnitude in your speech, but it's sort of the formula you wanna have in your head when you're thinking about why one impact would be bigger than the other. And this is like very vanilla weighing. Like, the, like, like this is like, if you have already weighed an argument before in a speech, you've likely done it by using this formula. I'm just sort of like making it very explicit, right? Um, but this is like a, the generally the way people think about weighing. Um, the second, and now I'm gonna get into some like more interesting ways to weigh. Um, the second way to weigh is mechanisms against other mechanisms. So the first way to weigh I discussed uh, typically involves two impacts, right? Like you're weighing your impact against their impact. What happens when you're trying to weigh the same impact, right? Like both sides are trying to access the same impact. And let's go back to the progressive doctrines motion that we talked about earlier and talk about the prop argument that says that, you know, young people, we get young people to join the church. And then the op argument, which says you drive away like older conservatives from the church. You're talking about the same impact, right? Which is uh, church membership. How would you compare your side versus their side? What is a good way to weigh the prop against the op? Comparing the importance of keeping old people in the church versus bringing in young people to the church? Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. Could you give me an example of something that, like an argument that does that? Uh, sure, so like um, maybe old people constitute most of the church, young people don't constitute much of the church now and they won't ever because like you said earlier, they're interested in other things. Yeah, so uh, this argument is like fairly clear, which is just like this mechanism is young people, uh, this mechanism is old people. Uh, what Brendan is saying there is that like uh, this mechanism is bigger in terms of scope. Uh, there are just more old people uh, involved in the church. Um, what else? What's a reason why young people might be more important than old people? Well, they're younger, so go ahead. No, no, you know, please, please, you haven't. Yeah, please. I think you're on the right track. Okay, like so. Old. Sorry, not you, actually. Uh, Pramanchi? Is that how you oh, say your name? My yeah, ancestors yeah. would be disappointed in me if I didn't get that right. right. Um, so basically, the young people are just younger, and so they potentially have more time to become involved in the church. The only assumption you make there is that they're like involved right now, but I think that's yeah. Fine. I agree, and I agree, and I think it's important you make that assumption because inst uh, but because this part of the debate is not refuting the other side. This part of the debate is weighing between two sides, right? And when you're weighing. You, you, you weigh in this hypothetical world that both sides win a substantial portion of their argument, and then you try to describe which one's more important. And I think Pramanshi just hit like the, the big one on its head, right? Like for why the young people mechanism is more important than the old people, which is like the old people got like 10 years max left, right? So what Pramanshi is saying is that this mechanism about young people uh, is, is longer lasting, right? Like that means that young people give like the rest of their 50, 60 years. Whereas like if you keep old conservatives around, they'll have a heart attack soon enough. Um, so they like die quickly. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone wanna give me a reason why old people might be more impactful towards church membership than young people? Sorry, I'm just doodling. This box has nothing to do with what's being discussed. Probably donors. Like maybe yeah. more time to get money. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. I like that argument a lot, which is like, you know, young people have like their careers to think about. They're like, you know, busy thinking about whether they're selling out to Wall Street or other things. Um, but old people got all the time in their world and they, they're likely to give lots of money. They're likely to volunteer more. So even if like the prop gets a higher number of young people, in terms of the qualitative, so even if the prop outweighs on quantity of young people they get, the qualitative impact of every single old person you keep in the church is bigger. Does that make, does you see how these weighing arguments, how I you to compare these arguments 
even if the other side wins a good risk of theirs. Yeah. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of the good reasons. I think uh, Hannah and Pramanchi had some excellent arguments and those were, I think, the best weighing arguments for each side. Um, so that sort of is the second way to weigh. Um, now I wanna chat about the third way to weigh. And this one is my favorite because it is the most underutilized and it's also underutilized in all the other events I do. Um, and it makes me sad. So I want it, everyone to utilize it more. Um, uh, before I move on, um, let's see, who am I gonna cold call on? Uh, Vinayak, uh, what were the first two ways to weigh? Uh, the first one was probability times magnitude. The second one was uh, weighing one mechanism versus another mechanism. Hell yeah, give me a, give me a virtual high five. Cool. Um, all right, the third way to weigh uh, is uh, interact your impacts. This is really important because nobody ever thinks about this, right? Like people weigh their impacts against each other in a vacuum but impacts influence other impacts, right? Like your impacts interact with theirs. Um, and I'm gonna walk through this with an example and we're gonna prep another motion because I love incorporating drills into lectures since it keeps y'all awake. Um, and my voice gets annoying after a while. Uh, this house supports a carbon tax. Uh, take two minutes, think about, uh, think about a prop and think about like the, the general thesis of like a pretty big prop argument and the general thesis of a pretty big op argument. They don't have to be super fleshed out since we're only gonna be weighing the impacts of them. All right, someone give me a prop argument. Um, you could argue that with carbon tax, companies will be incentivized to invest in renewables, which then helps the environment. That's like the very basic prop ground. Yep, renewables plus warming. Op. Um, and then the most basic op argument I think that I've seen is that it stifles growth of less developed nations. Yeah, I think that's just like a economy argument. And it's both it's both about like less developed nations and about developed nations, right? Like it just messes with the economy. There's less economic growth, like companies lose money. Economic growth is important. You don't want to wreck the economy. Great. Um, so let me, and this one's super fun. And I, I love the like reveal here. Um, okay, so the prop impact is warming. And the op impact is the economy. So someone give me a reason why the warming outweighs the economy. You can, you can use any of the reasons. You, uh, so you, could, you should probably not use mechanism versus mechanism because we're talking about two different impacts here. So probability times magnitude is the default, right? So someone want to tell me why warming outweighs the economy? I'm sorry, I cut someone off, but I wanted to say that before they started. You can say without helping the environment, companies will also lose money, the costs associated with climate change. Yeah, that's true. I like that a lot. Uh, what's a reason why another reason why warming is like bigger or more likely than harming the economy? 
um, because things like the economy can always be repaid in the future. I debt can always be repaid. Losses can always be repaid, but any degradation to the environment can never ever be repaid in the future. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, it's just more probable because it's already happening. Like the, the environment is yeah. Already yeah, I just think that like it's just so much bigger is the like big one, right? Like this is like think about global warming and carbon emissions. Then like you know like oh no, GDP fell below two percent growth in the fourth quarter, right? Like uh, I I can't imagine someone thinking one of those is more important than the other. But I actually think the star and the winner of today's weighing argument is this one. Um, and the reason I think this is going to become clear to you in a second. So we talked about, I mentioned that impacts don't exist in a vacuum, right? And these two weighing arguments weighed these impacts in a vacuum. They said that uh, warming is bigger than uh, harms to the economy because it's just like more probable. It affects more people. The damage is much more pernicious, like that type of thing. That's great weighing. You should always do that weighing. Whenever you can, you should also do this type of weighing, which is that, what is the prop saying? The prop saying is in that in the status quo, global warming is going to happen. If we don't have a carbon tax, like we won't be able to solve that global warming. What happens to the economy in a world where we don't solve global warming? There's no economy. Yeah, it kind of goes boom, right? So I think at the top level, which is just like, like if civilization collapses, um, I guess GDP goes away too, right? Um, and I think that's a very persuasive argument because you're making an unsustainability argument, right? You're saying that the status quo is unsustainable. The world of the opposition is unsustainable. Warming will collapse the economy eventually, which means saving the economy for a small period of time right now doesn't matter because it will eventually happen. So it's important to solve warming first. Can someone think of where this argument would map in terms of the car analogy for the economy argument? I, if we did the if we did the cliff uh, analogy for the economy argument, where would it map this argument that warming will eventually cause economic collapse? We can say that the car is already being pushed off, so no matter what they're saying, the the movement that's pushing the car off the cliff is already going to happen. Yeah, exactly. So think about what they're saying. The op is saying that this is economic collapse right like oh no wall street um and then it's saying that we're not in economic collapse yet right like we're pretty close but i mean like we were, were like far enough away and then the op is saying that this arrow is the carbon tax and it's going to push the car over the cliff and make some bankers very very sad what you're saying with this weighing argument is that there's like another secret arrow and it's about this big and it's called global warming. And so even if the carbon tax pushes the car a little bit off the cliff in the short term, there is like this big arrow that even if you erase the carbon tax arrow is gonna drive the cliff off the economy anyways, or drive the car off the cliff and harm the economy anyway. So yeah. I think that's a very great way to weigh because it interacts your impact with theirs, right? It says that if we win, that we solve our impact, it turns, I, it, it actually makes their impact worse. It means they have, do not have any unique offense or unique arguments. I think there are more nuanced ways to do this too, right? So this is like a big long-term one, which is like if warming collapses the economy, like we're not going to, um, like we're not going to have an economy in the first place. And that's very long-term. Like that'll take a couple, that'll take like at least a hundred years, right? What's a more short-term version of this argument? That's like, if we don't pass a carbon tax, it's going to harm the economy. Or like, if we don't resolve uh, carbon emissions, it's going to harm the economy. Someone said it earlier. Oh, they didn't say it as a weighing argument. They made it an actual argument, like a, like a substantive argument. But there's one particular word that I think can explain why you get short term, why you turn the economy in the short term. Starts with an R. Reverse renewable the resources. Yeah, renewables, A plus. Um, uh, I think that like the argument that's just like, look, renewables aren't coming in the status quo because so, so the basic economic principle behind a carbon tax is something called a Pigouvian tax. You don't need to know that. 
Um, but the whole point is that uh, there's like some negative externality to emitting carbon that's not priced in by the market, right? So um, like when a company chooses to emit carbon, it's, it, it, that company isn't harmed by the like social cost of uh, emitting carbon, right? That, that, that social cost is far off in the future. And so it's not really taken into account by the price of carbon in the market. The reason you would tax carbon is in order to make the market take into account that negative externality, right? You tax carbon in order to make the market correctly price carbon in terms of the social costs and social benefits it has, because right now the market is not accurately pricing carbon because it's ignoring this negative externality, the social cost that emitting carbon imposes, right? When you say that, so your argument is actually the market is misreading carbon right now. And that's why the market is also not investing in renewable energies because the market artificially thinks that carbon is sustainable because we've basically tricked the market, right? Like we've tricked it into ignoring this big negative externality. What you're saying when you say we get renewable growth is you're saying you're actually correcting the market, right? Like if you don't have, like if we don't adequately invest in renewable energy soon enough, like we're going to run out of oil, right? We're going to run out of natural gas. We're going to run out of all, of all of this other stuff. And guess what happens to the, the, the like fossil fuel company stock prices then? That's a question. They plummet. Yeah, yeah, they plummet, right? And this phenomenon is called asset stranding, basically. Um, and it's basically like, since the market is uh, incorrectly pricing fossil fuels right now, right, it's overestimating their worth, um, given like eventual peak oil and uh, global warming. Um, there are a bunch of people that have investments in fossil fuel companies whose investments are also overpriced. Uh, so if your argument is a carbon tax corrects this uh, by accurately pricing renewable energy in the market, accurately sort of like bringing the market together, um, uh, then you actually help the economy because you help investment be more intelligent, right? You take away investment from fossil fuel companies, shift it into renewables because now you're accurately pricing carbon. So that's why this way of weighing where you think about your argument um, in interaction with your opponent's argument is a great way to weigh. Uh, what's the flip side of this? Um, what's a way to weigh that says that uh, the economy affects warming? Well, without a strong economy, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you can go ahead, it's cool. Oh, uh, well, without a strong economy, uh, it's hard to invest in expensive green tech, which uh, in turn prevents improvements on warming. Yeah, I agree. And something additional that you can do there is you can be like, yeah, like even if we stopped emitting all carbon at this point, warming would still happen, right? The only way we get uh, like, any way to actually resolve the effects of warming is if we have like green technology, if we have technology that can reverse the effects of warming that can actually be healthy for the environment. And the only way to get that is if we have a strong economy, enough money to spend on this technology in the first place. So that's like the flip side of this argument, right? Which is that like, if the economy collapses in the short term, if a carbon tax harms the economy in the short term, it's gonna kill any movement right now to shift to green tech, to shift to um, renewable energy sources, right? Uh, and now you've added an extra nuance, which is you're like, the economy affects warming much faster than warming can affect the economy, right? So in addition to making this argument, you're actually answering these arguments, right? Because these arguments happen in the long term, but your argument is that the economy affects our ability to uh, like stop like global warming in the short term. So it, it happens faster, right? And this is how I think you should think about impact weighing. Um, uh, because I think it's very, very useful to think about impacts interacting with each other, think about the implications of the impacts on each other. Um, okay, everyone take another like four to five minute break. Um, I'm going to stay on. You can feel free to chat with me um, about just like whatever. Any questions? We can talk about TV shows. Uh, I'm currently obsessed with this anime about volleyball. Um, or you can go like go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, that kind of thing. Is that Haikyuu? Oh yeah, it's so good. Bro, it's super good. How far are you? Uh, I have finished season three, and then I'm stopping before I watch season four because I'm rewatching. Uh, I'm rewatching with some friends. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, actually, I just uh, I just forced on to watch Haikyuu, um, and she's like four episodes in, and she loves it. She said she finished the season yesterday. She did. That's what she told me. 
incredible. I'm so proud of her. Uh, and then like, I'm, I'm, I'm watching, uh, like I, we have a, me and my uh, roommates or like hopefully soon to be roommates if I get to go back to college within the year um, are doing like, we have like a Saturday anime night and we're watching Haikyuu right now. It's so good. It's also so hype. Uh, anyone who's going to be like a debate senior should watch it because it has some great like moments of reflection in terms of like putting your all into a high school activity and what happens when that ends. Um, and what happens when you debate for the last time. I know it goes so crazy. I get sad watching it. Damn. I cried at the end of season two. <laughs> um, one sec. I, I'm going to send you, have you seen the end? You've seen the end of season two, right? When uh, Abu Josai and say like like when Oikawa loses and his career ends. Oh yeah, that was the funniest thing ever. It was so sad, but it was also like I don't know. Yeah, it was so so sad, wasn't it? Like it was genuinely just so emotional. Um, yeah. There is an alternate ending I found, and I I like wept. No way! Did they win? No, no, no. It's like it shows some extra stuff of them like sort of processing their loss. I forgot how they lost again. How did they lose? Who dropped the ball? Uh, um, uh, Hinata hit it at a couple blockers. Um, and oh, yeah. they like, yeah. Let me find this link. <laughs> yeah. So like initially, I um I bleached my hair like this to look like Nishinoya. <laughs> that's that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like it was just a joke but then i did it wrong and i was like yo what did i do to myself and then now i'm here and then like, so it funny. used to be like brown but then i was like nah yeah. oh my god i'm obsessed with this show <laughs> it's so good <laughs> i've never wanted to play volleyball more in my life and i can't jump more than like two inches so <laughs> I never knew how to play it, but after I watched it, I wanted to play it so bad. Yeah, I want to play so bad. It gets you so hyped. <laughs> um, like, there's a reason I debate and not play sports, but God, I want to play. <laughs> I want to play volleyball so bad. Um, how much time do I have? Oh, I have. Oh, my God. I'm going to get through everything. This is awesome. And I'm giving breaks. Like, uh, it's going so well. The only thing I'm not sure is like if everyone everyone's like understanding things, right? Like Are people finding this useful? Like or am I just like saying just really basic things to y'all and y'all are like, well duh, Ishan. Um That's cool. Okay. Like Bro, how do you know what they're saying? It has no subs. Oh, uh, hit subtitles on the, uh, oh, gosh, gosh. yeah, it gets good around like one minute 45.
Okay. I have no idea when the five minute break started. So I don't know if people are back yet or not. Um, doesn't look like people are super back yet. So I'm gonna go make myself a cup of tea. I'll be back in like a minute. All right, are enough people back yet? I see some videos. Yeah, I think this should be fine, whatever. It's been more than five minutes, I think. I have no idea though. Um, cool. I hope you appreciated my art. All right, uh, fourth thing we're gonna chat about is uh, model attacks. And this is gonna be pretty brief, um, but um, this happens a lot because the, the proposition gets pretty much like an extensive amount of freedom uh, to model the motion, right? Like they get to really specify uh, what they're gonna do. They get to add a bunch of like other things to the motion that they will. So like if, if the proposition is modeling on like this house would uh, like, you know, impose a carbon tax, like price and environmental damage into goods. Um, the, the proposition might also throw into their model, like, oh, we're going to use the revenue from the tax to like give uh, energy subsidies to poor people. So they aren't, you know, affected by the increase in prices. Right. And I think the proposition totally gets to model that kind of stuff. Right. The proposition gets to just like describe what a really a thorough world looks like in the world of their case. Um, so this, the situation may arise every now and then where you need to make a model attack. I you need to say that the proposition does not get to model this in this manner. Um, the proposition does not get to sort of say that this is how they're going to do things. The first and the method you should use the least is by saying, by directly saying that they don't get to do this. Can't do it. Um, and this is the method you should use the least because world schools judges really dislike procedural debates and they want you to engage with proposition's best ground. So even in a world where you think proposition has modeled something very, very weirdly, you should always say like, all right, they're not gonna be allowed to do this, but even if they do, we can engage. An example that I think is important is that there was a motion at NSDA about how like uh, the, the house regretted, the, this house regrets the myth, or this house regrets the idea that like going to college is key to success or going to higher education is key to success. And some team tried to be like trade schools are an example of higher education, which is not true. Like trade schools are something you do instead of going to higher education. 
um, or you just like immediately get a job after graduating high school. Um, the, the problem with this is that like, uh, when you, that's why that, that's an instance in which you should just like, um, make the, make the model attack and you should just be like, Hey, that's not what the higher education means. It's very obvious that that's not what it means. But even if that is what it means, we're going to engage with you anyway. So I think you can, uh, definitely, um, say that, uh, one sec, my iPad is disconnected from the Wi-Fi again. Um, so I think that that's like a, a way you can make a model attack. And I think that's like fairly straightforward and that should be done when like the model is excessively wrong. Um, the cooler way to make a model attack and the one you should use more often is like really sneaky. And it's how you, you basically sneak a model attack into your own substantive arguments. Um, and this happens when the other side models a motion in a way that you think is unrealistic. Um, instead of saying that they don't get to model it like that, Basically, you say that like that may be the model that they said, but it's unlikely that it gets implemented in that manner, or it's unlikely that that like actually gets done. So I'm going to give you all a motion, and I'm going to ask you to come up with a gov model for it, um, a gov model that tries to solve as much of the op case as you can. The motion that is before the house today is as follows: This house supports racial profiling. You have to model a proposition. Let's popcorn this. So people start giving me like thoughts they have on what should be included in the model. Like, how would you do this? Yeah, I have a question. Is this supposed to be an abusive model or like a, a, a real one? No model is abusive. The gov gets to model. Okay. So, someone's got to have like one thing, right? Like one thing they would say if they were trying to defend this. You, you could say um, racial profiling against young white men who tend to be school, because they tend to be school shooters. Like that could be yeah. the route that you went down. Yep. Um, yeah, I agree with that. So just, I mean, like, I don't think, so this is an example of where I think there is an abusive model. You don't get to say you're only going to use it against white people, right? But you do get to say this is a thing that will likely happen. So at the top, you can be just like, look, when we say racial profiling, here's what we mean. We're going to use someone's race background and uh, like, you know, economic status as data points in uh, context with other data points to sort of determine likelihood of committing a crime and likelihood of being a victim of a crime. So we're going to say something around the lines of like, look, we understand that young white men are more likely to like end up doing like, like young white people in Germany who are in bereft economic conditions are more likely to fall into Nazi gangs. We're never going to preemptively arrest or search someone because of our racial model, but we are going to like, you know, make sure they're not joining Nazi gangs. We would be able to investigate that. We'll use it as a backdrop in terms of like other things, like maybe potentially getting a warrant, that type of thing. So that's what we're talking about. We're just using data on race, uh, on people's race, racial background to sort of like support what they're likely to do. Um, and we're likely, it, it's, it's just sort of like predictive data science. In the same way, we know that some people are more likely to be victims of crimes more than other people. For example, women are more likely to be like subject to like, you know, sexual violence crimes. We're going to use that as a, we're going to use that as a data set uh, in, in order to like predict where like intimate partner violence could be happening in a community. And instead of like preemptively, like and when we say preemptively, like when we say racial profiling, it doesn't mean we have to arrest someone. That means we could provide communities of color and low income communities with like more resources to deal with things like intimate partner violence, 
Um, we could provide them with more resources to deal with things like uh, community crime, that type of thing. So everyone sort of like see where this type of modeling is going. Um, and then, you know, sometimes we will police areas harder uh, because we have statistical proof that they're more likely to commit crime, but that's like, we're not gonna be like, that's just a, that's a fact, that is a reality of the world. Like, why is that wrong? Anyone have other things they throw in the model here? Uh, I had an idea. It's mm -hmm. definitely, definitely not the heart of the motion. But given that profiling is the use, like racial profiling is the use of like a racial data point to predict behavior and performance, uh, could this house support racial profiling in university admissions uh, to consider like, basically affirmative action, but using yeah. one's race as a data point for specific discrimination that can be used to uh, in conjunction with other data points like testing to predict performance in comparison to other applicants. Yeah, uh, but I don't think you can say it in terms of colleges. I think you have to say it in terms, like this motion is clearly set in a criminal justice type fashion. So you can say that like, we'll use affirmative action style. Um, like, like the, I think the info slide something said something about criminal justice or something okay. like that. But, uh, and this motion is generally about criminal justice, but you could definitely say something around the lines of like, look, if we racial profile, then we get to do actual racial impact assessment, right? Like we get to see if a judge is assigning one race versus another race, so like harder, like harsher sentences. If we keep track of like people's races while we, you know, uh, when they get processed through a criminal justice system. What's another thing you might want to add to this model? No one has any ideas about how they would defend racial profiling. I'm shocked. Um, seriously, I'm looking for just like one other thing you might want to add to this model. It can be a fleshing out of something that I like briefly said in my little rant. Maybe like distribution of economic benefits. Cause like if you profile like based off of race, you could say like one ethnicity or race is disproportionately harmed in the economy. So therefore like X amount of welfare, or X amount of government subsidies should go towards that group. Yeah, and I think that that can be done in just terms of community policing, right? So like, for example, uh, we're gonna like protect stores, in, like, you know, we're gonna protect like community centers and like we're gonna protect stores and build community centers in areas that have a higher likelihood of committing crime. Um, and race is often a data point in terms of this type of analysis, right? Okay, so racial profiling is obviously bad. Uh, the op is just like, this is extremely racist. It increases violence against racialized communities. It over -polices them. But the gov has modeled it like so, like the gov has modeled it in an extremely reasonable sounding way. How would you go about attacking this model? You can probably say something like, um, this is what their intent is, but what happens in reality is that it can overly be like abuse on individuals who uh, may want to just not conform to that type of standard that you set in the mall. Yeah, um, and I think that the important part, oh, sorry, someone else said something. I was just gonna say like more specifically, you can talk about how like algorithms that we would create to like carry out these types of things rather than just doing them by hand are like usually inherently racist. So no matter like what your intent is, like he said, basically. Yeah, um, I agree with both of those things. And then the trick that you should add to both of those things is you should, define, you should define them and support them substantively as opposed to a theoretical model attack, right? So instead of saying they don't get to model it like that, you can concede that they get to model it like that, but then say something around the lines of around the following. Look, even if they get to model that they use algorithmic policing, here's the problem. That data is collected from individual policing reports. If individuals officers have biases against like black people or people of color or like Arabs in like New York, it doesn't, it, it, it means that the data itself is likely to be skewed in a certain fashion, except now you have scientific backing for your racism, right? You're saying that, look, you know, like brown people there commit more crime. That's why we police them more. But it ignores the fact that like the reason they statistically commit more crime is because you police them more, right? The second, you can, second thing you can say is you can characterize the resources of each department, right? So you can say like in this nice like fantasy world where like you're gonna give more resources to communities that are more affected by crime, but that's not what the like uh, incentives for local police officers are, right? Like a lot of times the local sheriff is elected, right? And 
they get elected by people who are more likely to vote, which are people who have more time on their hands, more money, more likely to be conservative, more likely to be white. And those people love a tough on crime platform, which means if you get access to racial impact data, they're gonna want harsher policing. So instead, even if you have like access to all of this nice data about racial profiling, what's gonna happen is that in response, in addition to like maybe community building, once that like fails or once that once people don't see the crime statistics goes down, you're gonna get like harsher response. But those type of responses are the ones that feed crime in the first place. So see how you can make these intuitive objections that you have to this like very idealistic model of racial profiling, substantive objections instead of theoretical objections to the model, right? And the way you do this is by characterizing the incentive of every actor and characterizing what's likely to happen when this actually gets implemented. Uh, this motion was set in like round five of 2012 worlds. Uh, it's a video, South Africa debates England on it. I'll put it in the Zoom chat. It's actually very good. South Africa wipes the floor with England. Um, uh, and it's a great example of how to like gov a very difficult motion. Um, yeah. I think everyone should watch the prime minister's speech, the first prop speech uh, after the, uh, if, if it is optional, you don't have to, um, but like once the like sort of lecture ends in like, I don't know, six minutes, uh, you should definitely give it a shot. Uh, I think it's a very, very good speech of how to model something and a very, very good speech of how to approach a, like a, a pretty rough motion for your side. Um, the debate community has grown in ways that like, you'll never have to defend racial profiling. Like this was a while back, um, but, uh, like, I think this is like a great motion to drill with because this this prop one speech is phenomenal. Like I was listening to it and I was like, boy, I sh am I wrong about racial profiling? Like what? Um, so I think that those type of speeches are always very good. And uh, this prime minister's speech, he's like this like snotty white guy, but he's like pretty cool. Um, like he's like one of the, yeah, like it's a good speech. Uh, you should give it a shot if you want to think about models and defending the hard side of motions more specifically. Okay. The very last thing I'm going to chat about is just a brief tip on characterizing arguments. So in this lecture, uh, we drilled a lot of motions. We came up with arguments for a lot of motions, like the religious doctrines motion, the racial profiling motion, carbon tax, et cetera. Well, the last thing I'm going to leave you with, and the fifth thing I wanted to talk about, was that every time you make an argument in prep, you should be using this type of popcorn style of talking about it with your uh, teammates. And the only question you should ever ask in prep when you hear an argument is why. You hear an argument, immediately ask why. You hear an argument, immediately say like, if someone said to you in prep, like, oh, our gov will be, our, gov, our government argument will be that young people leave the church, or we save young people, we get young people back into the church. Ask them why. And then they'll say something around the lines of, well, young people are really disappointed with the church's conservatism. So if we make it progressive, they'll come back into the church. Why? Well, you know, young people are searching, like a lot of young people, even though some of them like science, some young people are like searching for a spiritual spot in their lives to fill. You know, young people go through trauma a lot. And it's important for them to find a place where they can have a community. So they're looking for that community. They just don't want it to be racist and sexist. Why, right? And that process of just always asking why. So now instead of like young people are liberal and we bring them back into the church because we make the church more liberal, you have a very nuanced argument about how young people are searching for community in their lives and their local communities, they have a stereotype of, of them in their head that they're you know conservative and not progressive. But if they change to progressive doctrine, young people are likely to find that more palatable, right? So now what you've done is you've constructed a more nuanced argument that already assumes the immediate objection, which is like, well, young people are going away for other reasons because they like science and don't like religion, right? So when you make an argument in the first speech and you've made it robust enough to assume the other side's objection, uh, what happens is when the other side raises that objection, uh, it immediately sounds shallow because your argument has already been constructed in a manner that explicitly assumes the objection and is built around it. So that's my final tip. In prep, you should always ask why, and you should do it as often as you can, and you should spend the majority of your time asking yourself why and building your arguments in a significantly more nuanced manner, and this applies to every motion we've drilled uh, so far. So this concludes like Yishan's miscellaneous thoughts on debate and arguments lecture, which is what I think it should have been titled. Um, I hope you found it useful. If you have feedback for me, you know, like uh, put it in the Zoom chat, email me on my like GDS email. I'll put that in the chat if you want. Um, and uh, like, you're free to go to lunch, uh, but if you also want to chat for like a few minutes before I eat lunch, that's also cool. If you have thoughts for me, if you have questions, um, if you wanted to let me know you liked the lecture, um, uh, that kind of thing, uh, like you're also welcome to do that, but you're free to go.
I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Let's stop recording.